So Jesse's bringing the word today. We're continuing our series in Acts, and we're almost done before we jump into Ephesians next. But why don't we stand to our feet and honor Jess as she comes to bring the word this morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? I'm so excited. Um, We are almost at the end of Acts, which is crazy. Um, I feel like we've been in Acts for a really long time. (laughs) Um, But Acts is just full of just so much wisdom and revelation for us. Um, I'm going to speak to you today... um, We'll do a little bit of teaching, but I'm also going to speak to you a little bit prophetically. Um, It's kind of just the nature of how I teach. Parker will tell you everything that happened ever in history, Um, what the Romans were wearing, all that stuff. I don't got any of that for you today. Um, I don't know what their cleats looked like. I can't tell you what happened in the year 800, whatever. I literally have no idea. Um, But what I can tell you is what the word of the Lord is for today. And what I can share with you is what the Lord is speaking to his people today. And um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, the Lord gives prophets to the body of Christ for um, the edification of the body, but also so that we're not running around like chickens with our heads chopped off. (laughs) Amen? Amen. And in a culture, and again, I'm going to emphasize culture of confusion, we need now more than ever to be people that are in the word, that are in the secret place, people of prayer, people of fasting, and people that are heeding the words of prophets. And I know sometimes we're like, oh, I don't know. Our prophets a New Testament thing, an Old Testament thing. Amos tells us that the Lord speaks mysteries to the prophets. And um, what I found a hundred times over is how important it's been for Parker and I to have prophets in our own life. Um, and obviously, Parker and I, we can hear from the Lord ourselves, like all of you. Because if you are a child of God, you can hear his voice. Amen which is awesome. That's why prayer, I'm like, I don't know why people don't want to pray all the time. I'm like, you're getting to talk to God. Like, that's crazy. But there are times when um, we need the voice of prophets to bring in truth and light. And sometimes I think the best prophets just remind us what God's already saying. And so... I hope this morning that this message is not a new revelation, but more of a reminder to you today. Um, So two quick things. One, um, uh, some girls and I went to New York end of June, um, really on an assignment from the Lord. I, I have a very busy schedule. I have four kids. One of them is a little baby. And uh, um, our lives are full. But I... Uh, I would say our lives are full of intention. We're very intentional with what we give our time to. And the Lord was giving me several dreams. Um, about I had 14 dreams in a row about New York City. So when you have that many dreams about a place, you better pay attention. <laughs> Sometimes people are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm like, what is the Lord showing you? What are you seeing when you pray? What kind of dreams are you having? Because the Lord is likely speaking to you, Right? So pay attention. Something that Lou Engel says, it's one of my favorite quotes, is he says, do the dream, right? A lot of times people are like, I have all these words, all these confirmations. Do that thing. That's the thing that you should be risking it all on, is the things the Lord is showing you. So I was having all these dreams and visions about New York and um, um, uh, gotten a lot of prophetic words about supporting Lou Engel in gathering a million women to the mall in Washington, D.C. this October. So raise your hand if you're planning to be in Washington, D.C. Awesome. Okay, I would encourage everyone in this room to raise their hand next time because this is going to be one of those historic moments for our nation. 
And I know you're like, but Jesse, I can pray in my house. You sure can. I hope you are now. And Jesse, I can go to the farm and pray. Absolutely. You definitely can. And I hope you are. But there is something that happens when the Lord extends an invitation to his people to come to a place to gather and take a stand and to humble themselves, to pray, to fast, to take communion and say that the plans of the enemy can't go any further. That's really important for us to understand as a church because all I'm going to tell you, everything you think that's crazy, it's going to get crazier. And that doesn't even take a prophet to recognize that. Okay, like, guys, we live in crazy times. But the people of God consecrate themselves humble themselves, they seek his face, they turn away from their wicked ways because they know that when they do that, their land is healed according to the word of God. Okay, 2 Chronicles 7 guarantees a promise to us, the church. And he says, if you, say me, if you will humble yourself, and seek my face and turn away from your wicked ways. You're like, my wicked ways? I'm a believer. Yes, your wicked ways. I will heal the land and I will hear your prayers. And this is a promise to every single believer. And so no matter what you see in culture, no matter what you see on the news, there's a guarantee to us when we decide to do God's plan, okay? And what happens is prophets on the earth release the invitations of the Lord. And so Lou Engel is a prophet to this nation. He has been praying and fasting probably more than all of us collectively in this room for the salvation and return of America to come back to God. Who wants America to be a nation established under God again? Come on. This is what we have to be believing for and laying our lives down for. Because this goes beyond just us in Wilmington enjoying the beach. Right? It has to. It has to. Right? So why would we go to Washington? Why would we go there? Because an invitation was extended to us to gather, to take a stand, to be inconvenienced. Going to Washington, D.C., I don't want to go. Truthfully, I don't want to pull my kids out of school. I don't want to pay for an Airbnb. That's an inconvenience. But I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, I just prayed at home, God, when you invited me to come and take communion with your ecclesia, your body, and to commit myself to prayer and to fasting. And you know what? We're gathering on October 12th in Washington, D.C., which is the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement is the day that the Lord decides if a nation will be blessed or cursed. Did you know that? And so we are stepping into a prophetic invitation to put our feet down in the place where the decisions of our nation are made. And to say, we come and submit ourselves to a higher authority. And so as believers, we will stand in this place and put our feet on the ground and declare that the evil plans that the enemy is sowing can go no further. And we will fast and we will pray. And do you know that when you fast and you pray, real things happen? So we are gathering October 12th. So I've been asked to help Lou mobilize this over the last year. So as I asked the Lord what I should do, he asked me to essentially pay 
personally from our finances to host a banquet of people that could rally people to Washington, D.C. and do it the week of the Pride Parade in New York and go and do evangelism at the Pride Parade. And so after a million prophetic confirmations, we went to New York. Lou joined us there in, Washington, uh, in New York City. And as we were gathering, the spirit of the Lord descended on this banquet. And his very presence filled the room. And I love when that happens because it's like just a little tap of like, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. You're doing the right thing. Keep going. Keep going. And what we need to do as believers is we need to pay attention to every prophetic word we got, every word that has been declared over this church, every word that's been declared over our nation. And this year especially, we need to hold fast to those words because those are the things that no matter what happens, they are true. And so I'm going to remind us of some of those words today. But in that banquet, Lou gave us an invitation. And all prophets do is they hand out invitations, and then it's a responsibility of the saints to receive them or not. And oftentimes we th see, obviously, throughout the Old Testament, how many times the invitations were rejected. And the ramifications of that. And so Lou extends his invitation to host a three-day fast. So we are fasting and praying. You can mark your calendars July 29th through the 31st as a church. <laughs> if you are not stoked, you don't know the power of prayer and fasting. So this book I'm going to encourage all of you to get. I know, look at the super cheesy cover. I feel like the best books have the worst covers, right? So this is called Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer. Has anyone ever read this book? Okay, look at how thick this book is. This is, like, not thick at all. You guys can literally read this in one day. But it packs a punch. And if you don't know about prayer, you don't know about fasting, you've never fasted before, you can speak to your kinship group leaders. They're going to help guide you through this fast. But I want to encourage you to pick this book up. You can get it on Amazon. It's right now $2 on Kindle. So if you can't buy that, I'll buy it for you. Um, literally, I'm like, it's the, the wisdom that's in this is worth way more than $2. Um, but I want to encourage you, get revelation on this, because here's the thing. If the enemy can convince you that eating a burger is more important than fasting, you've been deceived. And here's the other bait. When we're doing a fast, a lot of times the Lord will release you from the fast as soon as you're hungry. I promise you the Lord has not released you from the fast if he called you into it. We have to be people, and this is what my whole message is going to be on. We have to be the kind of people that give our yes and keep our yes. And give our no and keep our no. And we have to get instruction from the Lord. And I feel like, and I've been saying this for the last few months to Parker, I feel like many of you in this church are being tossed to and fro because you're trying to recalibrate and renegotiate with the words the Lord's already given you. And so it's creating an emotional exhaustion in you or otherwise called burnout. Because you're trying to make up your mind on things that the Lord has already given you a word about. And you're trying to reconfigure a way to be obedient by being disobedient. I want to tell you, the Lord does not tell you to change your job when your job's the hardest. The Lord does not tell you to store up things for yourself when it, you have fear of money. Usually, 
usually the way of the kingdom is the backwards way of your way of doing it. Usually, if you're called into a 21-day fast, day 10 is not the day that he changed his mind. (laughs) Trust me, I've been there. I'm like, I think now I'm actually supposed to eat pizza for sure because the Lord loves me, and I don't want to be legalistic. And all the swirl that happens... And I just want to encourage you guys, this year, more than ever, we need to be people of prayer. We need to be people that know the words over our own lives. What are the prophetic words he's spoken to you? What are the words he's spoken to this church and spoken over the nation? And we need to know them and commit to them and hold each other accountable to them. Right? So... I just want to encourage you guys. This is super important. So we are a church that fasts and prays. It's what we do corporately. And so as the leaders of your church, I am telling you this is what we are doing as a corporate body. We are praying. We are fasting on July 29th through the 31st. And if you choose to come under the submission of SALT's leadership, then you will join us in this time of corporate prayer and fasting for the sake of our nation. Okay, so we are asking you to humble yourself and trust us as we are leading you in a spiritual battle. Okay? All right, so that's the end of that. Um, So the title of my message... Actually, I have one more thing. Sorry. Okay. I forgot about this. Sorry. One last thing. I hate all the announcements, but um, I don't want to forget. One last thing. Um, August 8th. I think we have a graphic for it. Yes. Okay. August 8th, we are having a girls' night in at the Jerusalem's house. Every woman in this church is invited. Um, We're going to do a movie night, popcorn, fun like that. Um, but we're going to take a time specifically as the women of the church to come together. And uh, one of the words that I had specifically for the women over the last two months is that the Lord is, is trying to enlarge the place of our tent. And, uh, okay, guys, this, guys are going to like this word. <laughs> the men are doing a good job at this. <laughs> I actually feel like the men in our church are in a really strong and healthy place. Do you know that our biggest Sunday at Salt was Father's Day? Do you know how amazing that is and unusual for the church to have strong and amazing men? But as I was praying for the women in the church, there's a lot of prophetic words about women this year. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's like, this is the year of women. And I'm like, yes. And that also means that this is the assignment against women as well. The assignment to come into that feminist ideology, the like, this is my hour. My husband doesn't know how anointed I am. (laughs) This is my hour. And what we don't need is a million Jezebels descending on the mall in Washington, D.C., right? We need more Mary of Bethany's, amen, that will pay the price and lay themselves down. But as I felt in the spirit and prayed over our church, I could feel the tent pegs being stretched out. And I could feel in the spirit the canvas being stretched. And then I felt the souls of many women in this church, and they were vibrating like this. And the Lord said that you need to teach the women the rhythm of striking and resting and that the myth of balance is deceiving them. And so I want us to gather together as women and have a girls' night in. We're going to watch a fun movie. But I want to speak to the part of your soul that is weary. And I feel like some of you have not been able to find a rhythm of doing the things that you're called to do, being a mom, being a wife, and be at peace. 
And something that's taken me, and Parker can tell you, a long time to learn <laughs> is how to be someone that's in a storm and have peace. Honestly, a lot really doesn't throw me off now emotionally, even a really crazy schedule, because I've been able to learn the discipline of his presence no matter what's happening around me. And I want to teach you to not allow the opinions of others, their thoughts of your life, to stop you from doing what God is calling you to do and have peace through it all. And so I believe that he is trying. I could feel it in the spirit. So this is a word for the women. Women of salt, he is desperately trying to increase your capacity. Stop resisting him. Increased capacity looks like being asked to do things you can't do in your own strength. You can't do it. Ha! <sighs> Isn't that a relief? We can't pastor all the people that are coming. We can't take care of all the things in our household. We can't manage everything perfectly. But what we can do are people that have hope despite all things. People that know the peace of his presence. People that believe in him, no matter what we see, and we can be controversial in our hope. But he is trying to stretch us. He is trying to bring us to be like that Proverbs 31 woman who wakes up early, who works really hard, who's respected in all these places. Guys, we can't do that in our own strength. And the very invitations he's extending to you are hard. They are hard. You need someone to tell you he's asking you to do hard things. Sav, you can't do the calling on your life. You can't do it. It's too much work. Rachel, you absolutely don't have the time or the margin to do what's on your life. You cannot do it. You absolutely can't do it. Melissa, you absolutely cannot figure out how to do all the things in your heart. You can't. Why? Because he needs us to lean on him. He needs us to depend on him. He needs us to come to him and say, Father God, I don't know what I'm doing. So I again will come under the shelter of the most high and you will show me what to do. And this is a manna every day kind of Christianity. It's just enough bread for today. Just enough revelation for today. Just enough sustenance for today. Just enough anointing for today. And so as the women of salt, I want us to come together, brush off some of the dust, right? And step into this thing and hold each other accountable so that like Parker shared last week, we have no holes in our shields. So come August 8th. Guys, I'm just saying this because the last thing I want to do is to do a girls' night. I'm just going to be real. I don't really even like women's ministry. I'm going to be really honest with you guys. I don't. People are like, can we do this? I'm like, I really don't want to at all. I have zero desire. I really don't like women's conferences. I don't because I refuse to talk about fluff when people are mutilizing our children. <laughs> I just, I, there, we're, we're in a war. And so what I'm asking is, is that we don't just have a tea party, but we rally together so that we can take ground. Okay. So the title of this message is neither stars nor sun. Neither stars nor sun. Okay, so I want you to right now open up your Bible to Acts 27. We are in Acts 27 almost Acts 28, and then we are finished with Acts. Acts, in general, ends pretty abruptly. It's kind of weird. It feels like you're in the middle of a story. 
if you finish the whole of Acts, you're like, you're like, there's definitely got to be a second season because this feels like, like what? <laughs> um, and something I was saying to Parker about this is I love the change that happens in the writing of Acts when Luke starts to talk about him being in the story. And it, the language, I don't know if you've noticed, changes to we did this and we went here and we were on the boat. And I was like, man, Luke is like the most amazing PA <laughs> ever. <laughs> like he's writing all of this from a firsthand account, which is pretty crazy. So the shipwreck we're going to talk about, like Luke's in the boat. So this isn't like a secondhand story of like, Paul said this to me. It was really crazy. He's like, I was in the boat and this all really happened and it was really crazy. So many of the messages and sermons that have been preached on Acts 27, um, they really emphasize the focus on the storm. <laughs> if you literally go to YouTube and you put in like Acts 27 messages, it's like, the storms of life, when the storm comes, surviving your storm, right? And all of the emphasis, I actually couldn't find one message not about the storm. And I felt like that was a clue. I don't know about you. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're not at all. But I don't like the low-hanging fruit revelation. Anyone else? I'm like, I want the, like, real, like, what's the deep revelation in this? So if everyone's talking about the storm, I don't want to talk about the storm. I want to find out what's the meat of this message. So I want to propose to you today an alternate focus to Acts 27. And I think the focus really, truly, I think the storm is the low-hanging fruit. I think the real revelation of Acts 27 is the plans and purposes of the Lord. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you for vision. I thank you for revelation. I thank you that this is a prophetic church with the anointing to set captives free. I thank you, Lord God, that we can be attached to the head of the body, which is Christ. And I just declare that this would be a body that would storm the gates of hell and bring victory to those that are in darkness. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your will is for us to push forward the gospel despite all things. And so, Holy Spirit, I thank you that no plans of the enemy, no weapons formed against us will ever prosper. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, that as we form and step forward and take ground, that we will see the victory of the Lord in our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. So I'm going to just go back one second to chapter 26. And I think something that's really interesting here is in verse 32, Agrippa says to Festus this one line, and it really stuck to me. And I feel like this is kind of the um, umbrella for this prophetic word. So Agrippa says to Festus, he says, this man, he's talking about Paul, this is following up from last week. He says, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And that's when we go into the journey of Paul going to Rome as a prisoner, okay, as a prisoner and leads ultimately to the shipwreck and his survival. So it says, Agrippa says to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. What I love about that one line, that one sentence, is the Christian life, the pathway of purpose, makes no sense to a world following human logic. Because we can go back and see Acts 23, 11. There's a word spoken to Paul. And this word is a word that will carry him through. Okay, so Acts 23, 11 says this. 
The following night, the Lord stood by him, stood by Paul. Okay, so the Lord is literally with Paul. (laughs) And the Lord, this is like a red letter, if you have a red letter Bible. The Lord says to him, take courage, Paul. Okay, take courage. For as you have testified the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. This is the word of the Lord to Paul. This is the assignment. This is the word. This is everything that Paul needs to hold on to. Okay, some of you have prophetic words over your life. Some of you have gotten prophetic words in this church. Some of you, the Lord has appeared to you in dreams, in visions, or even a Bible verse that just resonates deeply with you. And you read it and it just vibrates inside of you. Like Karis and I were talking and it was like, Psalm 1, right? It's like that word is burning in her. And the Lord will use many different ways to speak to you, okay? And our job as the sheep is to recognize the voice of our shepherd. And sometimes it's a still small voice. Sometimes it's a dream. Sometimes it's like this burning thing in you and you're like, I don't know why I care about this so much. I wish everyone cared about this. And what that is is It's your assignment. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay so much attention that I'm going to just go on to say, you should have these things written in a place that you see them all the time. The prophetic words of my life that that I, I believe are true, I have them written in my closet. So every day that I get dressed, I see them. Why? Because life happens. Because life happens and there are times where it doesn't feel true. There are times where it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. There are times where, okay, ready for the level up? The exact opposite happens. The Lord says to you, you're called to establish wealth. Two months later, you go bankrupt. What's happening in my experience is not matching up to the word. What do we do? This is supposed to be one nation under God. That was what this nation was established as. That was the decree on this land from the foundations. What we're seeing is the gospel and Christianity taken out of schools, taken out of the marketplace, and the church being thrust into buildings told that they have no voice outside of it. But what we experience does not outweigh the word. Do you understand? Do you understand? That's why it's important to steward the word. That's why it's important to meditate on the word. You need to know what the Bible says about you. Are you a son or are you an orphan? What does the word say? Are you anointed or are you discarded? What does the word say? We have to know what he says so that when the opposite happens, we can still take ground. So the word to Paul was Take courage. That's actually the first prophetic word that the Lord gives to him. Because basically he's saying what you've experienced up until this point, you're going to need more courage. And I don't know if you've read up until 23, but it's kind of crazy already. I think I would be annoyed if I had experienced Acts 1 through 23. And the Lord's saying, take courage. I'd be like, oh, no. Take courage. Haven't I been taking courage? To get to Acts 23, take courage. You kind of want to hear, man of great courage, right? And he's saying, no, no, no. Paul, take courage. You need to take courage. Salt, we need to take courage. What we've experienced thus far 
we need to take courage. We need to rally up faith again. We need to believe what the Lord has said about this church again. We need to believe the assignments on your lives again. We need to know that there are people in this church that have callings that will impact millions of people, and we need to remind them of that when they're seeing no fruit. We need to remember what's going to happen on that farm. We need to remember the people that are coming. We need to remember that this is a house of prayer. This is a church that heals wombs. This is a place that brings forth life. This is a house where demonized people come and they are set free. This is a place where people get baptized and real things happen. This is a church where people experience the tangible love and power of Jesus, and it changes the trajectory of their whole family and generations. That is the truth. So what we need to do is take courage despite all things. Okay, so what happens now is we, we've seen Acts 23 through 26 the last few weeks we've been going through. Paul's under trial. It's really crazy. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't take the easy way out. Why? Because he's given his life to the word. So the word is get to Rome. And the only way that he can get to Rome is by being a prisoner. And literally, Agrippa says to Festus, he's like kind of in shock. And he says, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And there are people in your life that are trying to use worldly reason and worldly wisdom for your better outcome, and they're wrong. You could have all of this if you chose this way. Why are you choosing to give 40%? Shouldn't you be investing 40%? That's the better way. When the Lord has given you the gift of generosity and has given you a vision and a word to sow sacrificially. His kingdom is backwards. It's the first, last kind of kingdom. It's the die to yourself so that you may live kind of kingdom. So when the world is trying to understand it, unfortunately, they can't. It's the one that says, okay, forget the strength you have, surrender, and that's the new strength. Get on your knees and pray when you feel like you need to fight. And then when you feel like you need to pray, get up and fight. It's like, it's totally backwards. And it never makes sense. Why? Because he needs us to rely on him. And he needs us to be the kind of people that are set on the word, even without people understanding. Okay, so Acts 27, verse 9, it says this. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, they're on the ship, they're going to Rome. Because even the fast was already over. Okay, the fast, this is so crazy because I was going to talk to you guys about October 12th. The fast is the day of atonement. They are literally about to enter into a storm because the day of atonement is over. Which means now the nation is under blessing or under curse based on how they handle the ways of the Lord. Okay, so it says the voyage was now dangerous. Why? Because they're rejecting the gospel. Do you understand? Okay, I know this is like prophetically a little bit deeper for you guys. But when you rebel against Christ, you actually don't get his blessings. I don't know what you're seeing on Instagram, but we actually have to be people that follow in his ways, right? Obey his commandments. Who are the friends of God, the ones that obey him? People are like, I'm his friend, but they live in total rebellion. You're not his friend. A friend is one who follows, who obeys, who listens, who gleans. And so it says, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul, a man of the Lord, advises them. And he says, sirs, I perceive. Okay, that word perceive actually means prophetic insight. He's saying, he's not just saying, I see a storm. He knows nothing about sailing. That's why they don't listen to him. 
right? He's saying, I perceive, I prophetically see in the spirit, I'm seeing something that you're not seeing. He says, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. He's giving them a prophetic warning. Okay, listen, church, salt, lean in right now, press in. But the centurion, okay, please pay attention right now. The centurion paid more attention. Say more attention. More attention. Say more attention. To the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Okay, first thing. I believe that the enemy against the words on your life and the calling on your life and the anointing on your life the b- biggest threat is not the devil. The biggest threat against the calling, the prophetic words, the mission of what you're supposed to accomplish, the mission of salt, the biggest threat is not Satan. The biggest threat is human logic. Us trying to figure it out without him. William Temple in 1943 said, Christian tradition was in danger of being undermined by secular humanism because the church would try to retain Christian values, morality, tradition, coming to church on Sunday, Enemy don't care if you're in church every Sunday. You can sit here day in, day out. That isn't, he doesn't care. He's totally fine with that. You can have the front row seat for all he cares. The danger is retaining Christian values without Christian faith. If you are doing the Christian activities without Christian faith, It's pointless. And we cannot, okay, this releases you from all the burdens. We cannot do the words, the assignments, be bold. We can't win the nation. We can't be generous on every occasion. We can't heal the sick. We can't raise the dead. We can't cast out demons by human logic and reasoning. It doesn't make sense, and that's the whole point. The whole point is when we are weak, he is strong. Why? Because he deserves all the glory. And guess how he gets all the glory? When we say, I don't know how this all happened, but it did. I knew that I couldn't do it, but he did it. I just decided to trust in him. Okay, so the first enemy against your assignment, write this down is earthly wisdom and human logic. The centurion paid more attention to the pilot, the one who, quote unquote, knew what he was doing. I want to encourage you guys in these days, especially from 2020 to 2030, please pay attention to what I'm saying. It is important what heeds your attention. Where are you investing? Where are you getting wisdom? Where are you getting knowledge? Are you spending more time on social media than in the word of God? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you digesting? Are the people that are speaking in your life only inflating your ego? Are they trying to make you into a God? Are you listening to tapes and videos that tell you how awesome you are? And if you could just let this power inside of you come out and just affirm yourself to death because you are powerful. You are strong. You are amazing. You are called. You might not be following God at all. Be careful of the courses you're paying for. Be careful of the people you're spending time with. And the reason why I'm saying this is because we need to be paying attention to are these things making me more like Christ according to the word? 
if I'm never being asked to surrender, if I'm never being asked to sacrifice, if I'm never being asked to do something that's out of my comfort zone, then I might not be shaped into his very image. So the centurion is paying attention to the person that seems like they know how to handle ships and storms. Okay, verse 12. This is your second enemy, okay? And because the harbor, okay, so we got the pilot saying one thing. Okay, forget the pilot. Let's say the centurion doesn't listen to the pilot. On the other hand, though, because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. The second enemy against your calling and assignment that the Lord has for you and for this church is human perception. How you perceive things to be. Spiritual perception always requires prayer and fasting. According to scripture, we have to be people that pray and fast. Why? Fasting requires humility. Fasting requires you denying your right to eat because you are more hungry for him. Human perception will take you out of God's will because it's logic and understanding based on what makes sense to you. Moving across the country from California to North Carolina in a trailer with three kids really doesn't make much sense according to human logic. but we don't live our lives on human logic. We live as people on assignment, amen? Amen. There are some of the greatest evangelists in this nation, I believe, in this room. I truly believe it. I talk to people all the time, how many evangelists are in our church is overwhelming. The true gift of evangelism, the ability to win souls and have a boldness to preach the gospel that's unwavering. Human logic says, don't be so bold. They'll reject the gospel. You need to say it in a more appealing way, a way that they'll understand, a way that is not as aggressive. But the word says, no, the gospel is is the power to save. So they don't care if you buy them Starbucks and you never release the gospel, which is the power to save. And so we need to, again, not use human logic, but to listen to the word of the Lord and do what he says. Amen? Amen. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. The storm breaks out. This is what everyone preaches about. The storms of life, things get crazy. Duh, we all know it, okay? Verse 18, since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Guys, I don't know if you need to know this. I don't know if you saw the news yesterday. We are entering into crazy times. We've been in crazy times. If you have not known since 2020 that we are in the era of crazy, ring-a-ling-ling, wake up, because this is the crazy era, okay? It's like you, you can't make sense of any of it, and don't try to. It is not our job or responsibility to make order out of chaos, Our job is to be light where there's darkness, period. Okay, why would someone mutilate a child? Because they're demonically filled. And evil people do evil things. Sinners sin, right? Why would the government do X, Y, and Z? Because they're not priests. They're not saints, right? People are lovers.
lovers of themselves, lovers of money, endlessly chasing their own ambitions. Right? We're like, this is so crazy. It's really not. It's just the human condition and why we need the gospel. Right? Why would someone try to assassinate Trump? Because people are crazy. What was his logic? What was his reasoning? What side was he in? What group? What Antifa? It doesn't matter. We are in a place of war, and now more than ever, the church needs to know what the Bible says. And don't spend your time in the secret place trying to create order of the mess. Just be a person of the gospel that heals the sick, raises the dead, casts out demons, preaches the gospel, baptizes them, and teaches them to obey all that he commanded until he returns. If you do that, it will work out okay for you. You might be in a shipwreck. You might lose everything you own. But you will finish your race well, which is the assignment. Okay, so it says this. Okay, this is the title of my message. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. I believe that July through September salt is in. I hate to say this because this is not the fun word. But I believe that July through September, salt is in a neither sun nor stars appearing season where it is going to feel like hope is lost. It is going to feel like everything you believe for is not working. I'm going to beg you as a church to hold fast to the word and not to your feelings. Because I believe October, if we can break through together, and this is an all hands on deck assignment, and I'm gonna get into that in a second, but don't allow the enemy to take you out. No matter how much I've offended you, no matter how much you hate my preaching, no matter how much Parker has offended you, we should have prayed for you. We should have bought you coffee. We should have bought you lunch. We should have had you to our house. I can't believe they have this. I can't believe our kinship group leaders did this. Why do they meet on Wednesdays and not Tuesdays? Why do they have this coffee? and Whatever it is that's bothering you, I just pray you stay on assignment. And don't allow the enemy to take you out. Just stay in. Because I believe that if we can press into October together, there is a victory for us. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. There is a season that's coming upon the church in America and it's the season of hope abandoned. When thousands of ministers are exposed for horrible things, people lose hope. When it feels like everywhere is chaos, people begin to lose hope. But I pray right now over our church and the church of North Carolina and the church of America that we would be people of prayer and fasting because that is where our hope will be birthed. We cannot take the baits of human logic, understanding, or perception. Listen to me, Saul. Please pay attention. This is for your very good because there is a victory guaranteed to those that will stand. And when all hope fails, when the sun and the stars are not appearing in the day, we need to be people that are in the hull of the ship getting a word from the Lord. Because it says in verse 21, and here's the secret, and I think this is what our prayer cabin will be for the nation, not just for salt, but for the nation. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood among them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet, 
yet. The church is the yet word. We are the ones that say, despite what you see, despite what you're experiencing, despite assassinations against the 45th president, despite the abortion post-birth legislations that are happening, despite the manipulation, despite the witchcraft, despite the new age, despite what's happening in your finances, despite what's happening in your family, despite what's happening in your home, despite how you feel about your spouse, despite the divorce rate in America, despite the pastors and all the lies and all of the offense and the swirl and the gossip and the slander, despite all of that, yet God is still in control and his word will not come void, period. And so Paul says, yet now I urge you to take heart. So I know that there has been a crazy year behind us and a crazy year ahead of us. But I am urging you to increase your capacity to take heart. To increase right now the storms inside of you. Declare peace in the name of Jesus. Tell those storms to be silent in Jesus' name. Take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Listen, I can't guarantee that you're going to stay a millionaire if you stay in this church. I can't guarantee that you're going to have all this land and property and amazing blessings. I pray that for you, and I hope that for you every day. I pray that we would be the most blessed church that America has ever seen. I truly do. I pray, pray protection over your finances because I know we're called to generosity. I know that's an assignment on this house. But I can't guarantee that everything is going to stay comfortable. I can't guarantee that the Lord's not going to ask you to lay it all down and live in a trailer like Brittany and Kurt did to lead a revival now in an RV park. I don't know what that pathway is for you to the promise. But I know that if you take heart, you will get there. It says this. And Rick, you can come on up. It says, Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. I ask you, Salt, today, decide again, who do you belong to? Who is it that you worship? Holy Spirit, I thank you for a recommissioning today, for us to stand firm, to take heart, And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. This is what the angel said. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. I think it's no coincidence. Oh, it makes me want to cry. I think it's no coincidence that our logo is an anchor. I believe that this is a word for our church that God has granted you all those who sail with you so take heart men for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told verse 31 Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers Soldiers are about to abandon ship. And he says this, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. I believe that there are many of you in this room 
that are still holding on to ropes, trying to do this in your own strength, with your own logic, your own wisdom, and your own perception. I'm going to ask that at least from July to October, you would trust us that you would not abandon ship so that you would not be taken out. I actually believe that the enemy is prowling like a lion more than ever before. And I'm going to ask, and I know that this is, this is a scary thing for me to ask, but my heart is truly for you. I'm going to beg you and urge you to not abandon ship before October. After that, you can make whatever decision you want, but I'm begging you to stay in the house. Holy Spirit, if our hands are holding onto ropes, trying to figure out our own way, our own way, our own way, our own way of survival, I pray right now that there would be this corporate anointing that would come over the church, that we would lock shields with one another so that the enemy cannot take one person out. Lord Jesus, in these days, we need your words. We need prayer. We need fasting. We need people that gather together daily more than ever before. Verse 39, it says this. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land. But they noticed a bay with a beach. And I just felt like the Lord was saying, in the days ahead, we may not recognize life as we know it. but we'll, be, we'll get to the very promise that God has for us. It may look different than what we expected. Our family, our lives, even this very church. But I pray that we will get there together. And I pray that we could be a church that is a light in a world being tossed to and fro. And I pray that the most controversial thing of salt would be our hope. That we would be a church that despite all things, if there is one thing that we know how to do, I pray that it's we know how to take heart. We won't know perfect theology. We won't have it all figured out. We're going to make a billion mistakes. But we believed despite all things. And I know that this is a believing church. Parker, do you have on you, if not, you can just hand it to me in my bag, the um, vision statement of salt. If not, I have it on my phone, if you want to hand me my phone. Okay, so I'm going to have you guys stand to your feet. And uh, I felt like the Lord said to beautiful. I felt like the Lord said to recommission our church today. I think after Parker's word last week, um, that was such a good word, Parker. Truly, I feel like we needed that image of locking shields with one another more than ever before. Um, but I felt like the Lord said, Jesse, as a prophet, I want you to recommission the church and uh, um, re-enlist them for battle. And so I'm going to declare over you the vision and declaration and words over this church. And if you're part of this church, then these words are for you. Because the church is not a, just an entity. It's, it's Josiah and Paige. Like this word is for them. It's for Brad and Marissa, right? Like this word is for the weavers. This word is for Bree and Steve. Like, this is not just for salt, the entity. No, it's for the individuals that make up salt, right? And these, this vision was birthed in prayer and was birthed through prophetic words that were spoken over our church. Okay, 
And Rick, could you play the song Oceans? Because you were playing it before after rehearsal, and I woke up this morning hearing that song. And uh, um, every day when I shower, there's a line of that song that I sing over myself every day. And the line is, you've never failed and you won't start now. You've never failed, and you won't start now. So the vision of this church, and you guys could just open up your hands. If you're a member of SALT, this is your first time, welcome. <laughs> um, you can join us at the table afterwards and uh, join the movement of Taking Heart. It says, I see a church overflowing with life. A church at war against the gates of hell that sets the captives free, heals the sick, and raises the dead as we continue the commission of Jesus. I see a church with deep and broad impact that struggles to contain the growth that God gives us. I see a church that holds to the truth and stands its ground in an age of madness and disorientation. I see a church that venerates the aged and raises up children to live victoriously and establish in truth despite their circumstances. I see a church overflowing with families that live life in communion and genuine friendship in a world of surface and transactional interaction. I see a church that owns its heritage laid down by the apostles and prophets and looks to the future with enduring hope and steadfast faith. I see a church brimming with anticipation for the presence of God that cannot be and will not be contained. I see the saints equipped with the tools for the war that is life so that they overcome. I see a church that meets with multitudes and gathers at the table of communion. I see a church that produces a renaissance of art that transforms the cultural landscape. A church marching through history as an army terrible with banners that makes the enemy shudder at the thought of this group of saints. Holy Spirit, right now we enlist every member of this church for battle, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that this is a church that will not back down in the storm, in the crazy, in the madness, and in the chaos. We will still believe that you are victorious, Lord Jesus. We still believe that the gospel is the very power to save that which is lost. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. I command all confusion all witchcraft, all manipulation, and all control, all gossip, and all fog of war to be lifted off this church now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we thank you that we are people of vision. We are people that see in the Spirit. I thank you for the gift of discernment over this body of Christ. I thank you that this is a prophetic church and we declare right now that this church will see what the Lord is doing and take heart and enter into it with praise and thanksgiving. 
I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are equipping us to take heart in every battle. And I thank you, Lord God, that you would increase mercy, increase generosity. And I declare that this will be a church and is a church. That those that are not able to have babies, any infertility issues, I thank you that this church has an anointing to heal wombs in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord God, for the 53 miracle pregnancies that have taken. And I thank you, Lord God, that we will see thousands and thousands upon thousands of children born and raised up in this house as Samuel's, as Solomon's, as David's, that they will be those that cry out victory, that they will bring beauty, that they will be prophets in the house, Lord God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what took place during the camp meeting and the kids' revival, that you are touching our children in a mighty way. I thank you, Lord God, that our children are having dreams and visions about you, God, that they are often the first ones in the baptismal. And we pray protection over our children right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would equip us to raise up a generation that knows the truth and is like an Elijah and will throw down the prophets of Baal and all of the witchcraft in this nation will come down in our day. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Let it be so. Let it be so. And whatever part salt has to play, let us finish our race with endurance, fixated on what's ahead and forgetting every former thing. Let us take heart, stand ground, and hold fast. In Jesus' name, amen. So you guys can go ahead and take a seat. Our ministry team will be available for you at the baptismal. If you need prayer, if you need any kind of ministry, if you want to follow Jesus, we want to invite you to come and lay down your life. If you feel like you're caught in a swirl, you like don't really know what the call of God is on your life, we want to pray for you. You're supposed to know what God has anointed you to do. We want you to be in a kinship group so you can be discipled so that when things are foggy, you have people to your right and to your left that can help clear the fog. And so we want you to come and be baptized today and live a brand new life. And we believe as Christians that Jesus actually truly did die for your sins and you can live free from sin and the consequences of sin no matter what you did in a moment that consequence can be lifted by the blood of the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the earth and as soon as you decide to just turn to him in repentance and stop doing it your own way there is forgiveness for you because he actually died he actually rose from the dead and he gives us his holy spirit and so if you have been even holding on to that own rope of yours and that rope looks like you trying to save yourself and you want to let go of that rope and decide to cling to him and cling to his robe and his righteousness and be made new in Jesus right now. I just want you to throw up both hands. One, two, three, put your hands up. Thank you, Jesus, 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 thank you. Is there anyone else right now 
that wants to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, and not live for themselves or even the wisdom of the world, but they want to live His way right now. Throw your arms up right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, for your presence. And so we're going to ask everyone right now to stand up. Thank you, Lord God. If you decided today to give your life fully to Jesus, we want our ministry team to go ahead and pray for you downstairs over at the baptismal. And if you are new to SALT and you're like, what are these crazy people talking about? We're talking about the Word of God and the truth. And we want you to be a part of this church. And so after church, we're meeting at 284 Saratoga Way in Rocky Point. And we want to have a snack with you. We want to hang out. And you can ask us all the crazy questions. And Parker will try his best to answer them. And we just want to get to know you. And you can just kind of see if this is the church for you. So that's, again, right after this service, right at 1 o'clock at one o'clock. So you can go ahead there at 284 Saratoga Way. We'd love for you to be there with us. So Jesus, I thank you so much. When we can't rely on human wisdom or logic or even the perception of the world, when neither the sun nor the stars show us any sign of hope, I pray, Holy Spirit, that we would take heart. I thank you, Lord God, that you give us your word. And I pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen us for the days ahead. Bless this church. May your face shine upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great week.